This is Judge Joe Brown, and we're listening to We All Be News. News Free Dixie for the 21st century. This is Brother Ron Hurd live from the epicenter of white supremacy racism here in the belly of the beast known as America, <laughs> North American wilderness. I'm right in front of the grave of the one and only Nathan Bedford Forrest. Today's date is Friday, July the 15th. Uh, some people showed up, they thought it was gonna be a day of rage. Uh, but you know, like what James Baldwin said so many years ago, to be a Negro in America is to be in a constant rage. And I must admit, I'm a very angry Negro. I'm very angry. It's a righteous anger because I'm here in Nathan Bedford Forest Park. You got the cops behind me. They was waiting for a riot to bust out. They were waiting for something to go off overhandedly, some wicked plan, but it wasn't going as planned. But here I want to tell you all why it's so important to know your history. Because to know your history is to know yourself. My people perish because of lack of knowledge. And lack of knowledge itself is the reason why if we don't get our stuff together, we won't be heading to where we need to head to as a people. We won't get there to the mountaintop. But Nathan Bedford Forrest is a fascinating figure, very complex figure. He is a military genius, no doubt. His strategies, his tactics are still studied in military academies throughout the world. He is also the Michael Jordan of slave traders, the Sam Walton of human misery. On Adams Avenue or Adams Street, where the juvenile court in Memphis now rests, was once the largest slave market in America before the Civil War, and Forrest ran that with his partner, Maples. And also, he's a suspect war criminal. Some people say he is a war criminal, a psychopath. He led arguably one of the worst uh, events in Civil War history. He was commander of the Confederacy during the Fort Pillow Massacre. The Fort Pillow Massacre not only killed black Union soldiers who surrendered, uh, some people said that some of the black soldiers were playing dead. This is why some of them, or so many of them got buried alive. But also, it was women and children of color who were killed at the fort as well. So you talk to some of the elders out in Henny, uh, Fort Pillow, Tennessee, they, talks about, they talk about the mass graves of black women and children killed, and also of black Union soldiers who, after they surrendered, they were murdered. Now, people will say, well, this is very much a Northern bias. This is a Union bias, but you actually got documentations from soldiers who served under Nathan Bedford Forrest who stated that he told them no quarter, which means no surrender, kill them all, basically. So even his soldiers were traumatized by what they had to do to the black soldiers and even women and children at the fort. And also, he's the first Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. There is the Ku Klux Klan, a Christian terrorist group. It wasn't, a, it's not an Islamic terrorist group, but a Christian, so-called Christian terrorist group, founded in Pulaski, Tennessee, and he was the first leader of the Ku Klux Klan. So, I say all that to say also uh, that he might be also the father of private prisons. Like he actually had a contract to lease black convict labor on a place known as President's Island. That's an island located in the Mississippi River between Memphis, Tennessee, and Arkansas. He used black convict labor after the war to grow crops like cotton and corn and raise hogs and things of that nature. He actually died of dysentery October 29th, 1877, uh, probably from drinking poison water, like Flint water, <laughs> from that island. So I guess that's poetic justice. Now they wanna uh, make Nathan Bedford Forrest into a civil rights leader. Uh, one of his supporters, some of his supporters will claim the reason why he is a civil rights leader is because on July 1st, 1875, he gave a speech about civil rights and the black franchise, meaning black folks' right to vote before the Poll Bearers Association. Now, the Poll Bearers Association is allegedly a forerunner to the NAACP, which was founded in 1909. And uh, they said because he gave this speech about black folks, you know, being able to be successful in this system as, as far as their talent could take them, that he was a swell guy. Well, I'm here to tell you, I also got slave owners on my money, and you know, uh, so people are very flawed. So people say you cannot judge them by the standards of the time. 
uh, of this time. You got to compare him as, as a man of his era. And Nathan Bedford Forrest was a vicious man. You know, he might have been considered to some, like somebody says, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. He certainly did his part in most of his life to terrorize black folk and make a, a, a lot of money off of them as well. Like I said, he had the largest slave market in America before the Civil War, so he was like a Sam Walton, or he had the human Walmart, you know? And also the father of private prison, military genius, terrorist, and I guess statesman. Uh, also, I read somewhere that he was actually bringing over Africans from Africa to work at his businesses. Uh, I read a quote, you can probably find this quote somewhere in archives somewhere. But I say I'll just say, in a town that's 70% African American, why are we paying the taxes on this statue, uh, on this monument to white supremacy racism in a town that's 70% black? Why is that? Why? Just blocks away from here, you have the crucifixion site of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. A couple more blocks away from here, you have the spot on Bill Street where the great Ida B. Wells Barnett's newspaper office, the free speech and headlight, was burned down to the ground by the Memphis white power structure and she was effectively ran out the South. Luckily, she was not in town when that bullshit happened. They probably could have lynched her. That's why I'd be Wells, even though she was five foot one, used to walk around Memphis with two pistols on her person. She was a pistol packing mama. And also, he's been here, he died in October 29th, 1877, but Nathan Bedford Forrest had been bur buried here on Union Avenue since at least 1904 or 1905 when this monument to white supremacy to his so-called uh, white greatness was created. You know, him and his wife is actually buried underneath that equestrian statue. Uh, my understanding, the elders told me that the statue used to be facing north, but in the 40s they turned it south. So you already know what time it is with this. Okay, so I'm telling you, once again, why are we paying taxes on the upkeep of this statue in a town that's 70% African American. Now, I have no problem with the art. I think it's a beautiful work of art, but I think it's be shown with a beautiful work of art are, are normally shown, uh, shown, which is in a museum. And I think they need to rebury Nathan Bedford Forrest and his wife, uh, what we call repatriate their, uh, their leftovers, <laughs> their remains back in Enwood Cemetery where he belongs. Uh, because this is really becoming a um, public, public spectacle, really a uh, divisive symbol. Like I said, I'm all about freedom of speech and freedom of expression, but this guy basically was a traitor to the Union, to the Republic, for which it stands. He fought for the Confederacy, and they lost. But yet, people want to rewrite history like he won. Or maybe he did win, after all, his former slave market is still destroying black lives that should matter. Uh, his name is being amplified over and over again. You got not only parks, but also schools and, and roads and babies named after Nathan Bedford Forrest. Hell, even Forrest Gump made a comic allusion that, hey, he's related to Nathan Bedford Forrest and he was named after his cousin because of the Battle of Selma or some shit like that. So what I'm saying is, uh, people that don't know won't grow. I can remember reading in the Clarion Ledger during the 30th anniversary of the Emmett Till lynching. The Clarion Ledger had a chance to track down Roy Bryant, who was at that time the husband of Carolyn Bryant, uh, the lady that Emmett Till allegedly wolf whistled at or disrespected, him and his brother J.W. Milam, and as well as uh, maybe upwards to 10 to 13 people, including black people, murdered this 14-year-old teenager, drove him out, uh, out of his uncle's house, his great uncle's house, and basically lynched him for a wolf whistling at his wife. He moved back to the Delta after spending time in Texas. He was in bad health, and uh, the national news actually tracked him down to the Mississippi Delta. And so he was in hiding, but the Clarion Ledger was able to find him, and he did an interview with them. And I'll never forget the paraphrase what he said. He said, the black people or Negroes of today are not afraid, but they just don't know. So when I'm telling my black people, what good is it to be fearless and be courageous if you don't have any knowledge yourself, if you don't have any purpose, if you don't understand where you came from, who you are, and where you can go? 
So I think it's important to study up on Nathan Bedford Forrest because it, it never ceases to amaze me that I meet people that have lived in Memphis for the majority of their lives and yet they have no idea of the significance of this statue, let alone that it is a tombstone for somebody or a tomb for somebody that is highly revered by white supremacy racism. That is Nathan Bedford Forrest statue. I know they renamed it Health Sciences Park, but here's the thing, the people that know, know it's still Forrest Park because he's still buried here. And it will never ever be anything else unless they remove his remains and his wife remains and also this equestrian statue and put it in a museum where it belongs. Look, I have no problem with the Confederates and the you know, daughters and sons of the Confederacy getting together to celebrate uh, their hero, but not on the taxpayer's dime, especially a man who has proven to be a white supremacist and a racist, you know, again, his legacy being upheld in a city that's 70% African-American just don't fly right to me. So this is Brother Ron. Once again, another edition of We All Be News Radio on TV. In the words of the great Duke Ellington, we love you madly. Keep producing and pushing. And another solution I thought of, if, you know, we should reach a compromise. If they won't move this statue and move his remains, we should also make a statue to the victims of the Memphis Massacre, uh, one of the worst race riots in this country history. We just observed its 150th anniversary. The Memphis Massacre was the reason, is one of the reasons why the Congress, U.S. Congress initiated what is now known as Reconstruction Era. Uh, they actually came down here, members of Congress, including some of the radical Republicans, when Republicans really cared about black people, I guess, back in the day. They came down here to interview the survivors and the witnesses uh, what happened in Memphis over several days where you had white cops terrorize the black community of Memphis, burn down churches and schools. These are white cops, cops, blue lives, terrorizing black lives. This is documented evidence. This is true, this is real, this is not made up. Matter of fact, the person who saved the city was Robert Church Sr. And he was shot in the head in his salon, uh, saloon. Luckily, he survived to testify what happened to him. But he was the man who became the first black millionaire of the South. When the city faced the yellow fever epidemic, uh, they, he actually brought the first city charter or city bond to save the city, to reestablish it as a city. That's Robert Church, and they knocked down his church auditorium, the Crump Machine, back in the 20th century, and they burned down his fabulous mansion, a symbol of black pride and black success and black progress in South Memphis. They actually blew it up for a fire convention exhibit. I shit you not, I can't make this up. This happened in the early 50s. So here we got all these symbols of black pride and black progress destroyed. We had this symbol of white supremacy and oppression and repression still stands on taxpayers' money, majority uh, majority black taxpayers' money. So I would say, let us erect a uh, statue of memorial in honor of the Memphis massacre victims in this park, along with this statue. And let us commemorate them, let us celebrate annually, or even make a trek to Fort Pillow to celebrate the victims of the Fort Pillow massacre. Uh, I think we should, as African Americans, being the business of telling our own story in our own terms and also taking the time to commemorate the narratives, uh, to celebrate our heroes and sheroes, uh, to do what the whites have been doing, to ritualize them, to amplify their names for generations to come. We should be in the business of promoting our people by any means necessary. And it's so imperative that we do this. But there should be a memorial to the Memphis massacre victims. There should be a memorial to the Fort Pillow massacre victims put in this park so when the Confederate people, the sons and daughters of the Confederacy come to celebrate their hero, let that be a reminder that the ancestors ain't satisfied. The ancestors demand justice. They demand to be respected. They demand to be recognized. So we must do that as a people, uh, it's on our shoulders. And also, I mean, I have some other suggestions. I mean, Memphis such so has such rich black heritage. There's a lot of things we could do on a very positive way to bring people together. So those are my two cents I want to throw in and let you know everything else I said. Thank you.